It's a dangerous place, the clapboard jungle. Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore. You already know if you've been watching or listening to this show that I am a huge fan of documentaries. But there is a subgenre, a minor sort of subgenre, all types of documentaries. Documentaries are kind of like anime, right? Everyone's like, anime, yeah, that's a genre. No, anime is not a genre. It's a way to tell a story like animation. But you can have an animated film that is a musical, that is all types of different types of film, adventure, action, romance. And that is the same thing with documentaries. There are pop culture documentaries, sports documentaries, socially relevant documentaries, political documentaries. But my favorite, personal favorite subgenre of documentary is movies about movies. Documentaries about filmmaking, the art of filmmaking, documentaries about movies. And this documentary, I'm so happy I discovered it, Clapboard Jungle, directed by Justin McConnell, who joins us on the Film Threat Podcast today. Justin, thank you for coming on the show. Hey, nice to be here. Thanks for having me on. I Here's what I love about your documentary. If there was any person that's like, I think I'm going to be a filmmaker. I'm like, you have to watch Justin McConnell's movie. You must watch Clapboard Jungle right now because it, because it is such an inside baseball. The one thing I love that you didn't do, a lot of people tend to focus on the, hey, go for your dream, go for your dream. It really is a warts and all. You taking a really hard look at your career it spans years. Is it like seven years you spent? Uh, it's it's five years, give and take. I think the ending might jump forward eight or nine right. months, but it's about five years. Yeah, so you spend all this time really examining, like, look, I'm trying to make movies. I really want to get my filmmaking to the next level. Mm -hmm. And, dude, thank you so much because you go deep in this. Uh, I appreciate that. I mean, I... Ultimately, what I wanted to do was make a resource for people that uh, didn't exist when I was coming up. Um, I mean, I'm still coming up. Everybody is. But, uh, you know, when I first started getting into making features, say, in the early 2000s, uh, I was going into it blind. I knew nothing about how the, how the business worked or anything like that. So I thought, well, what can I make? What kind of a film can I make uh, for whatever money I could put together myself uh, sort of on the side while I'm trying to get other films made? And it just sort of hit me that uh, I should make something to help guide younger filmmakers or any filmmaker really um, on, on the ins and outs of the business side of the actual film business. Uh, so that was the goal I set out to make. Um, and I knew that I would, I should probably go out and collect as many interviews as possible uh, to get as many perspectives as possible. Um, partially because if it's just me talking to the camera, like who wants to listen to that really? <laughs> and part, but mostly because uh I wanted to treat it almost as a self film school too. You know, if I go out and collect 120 interviews with people all over the business, I'm going to get information firsthand uh, from people that I would not have got otherwise. And then I can edit that down into uh, a digestible or several digestible pieces for the uh, public to look at as well and sort of pass that information that I've gathered on. So that was sort of the goal. And then this feature film uh, that, that got finished and just did festivals and is now out across VOD um, is sort of the emotional side of like, how do you survive as a filmmaker? There, there's real practical information in it, but it's much more esoteric. Um, and then we have an eight episode uh, educational series coming out later this year, where every episode is a specific topic based on the filmmaking business. Uh, so they're two completely different sort of things. One's way more personal and one's more talking heads. Uh, but to give sort of a complete, as complete as possible package, because the business changes all the time. And you know, you, you can make a movie about the film industry today and it'll be outdated in three months. So it's it's much more uh, an overview and a way and like a, a way to open a door for people uh, and uh, maybe give them a, a bit of a weather vane, a direction of where to go, and and some hard learned lessons and things like that. Than it is an all encompassing. This is how it is kind of thing. No, you did a really good job of balancing it, but you also talked about really specific things about finance, mm -hmm. about distribution and that whole game. Um, and also you talk to some incredible experts. Um, one thing I'm a little, a little disappointed about, I, I think, I think I'm not in it. I, uh, no, I, you aren't unfortunately. And I'm, I apologize about that. No, no, I I've don't... actually seen you in uh, a fair number of filmmaking related documentaries over the years, like official rejection from what 2009, I think anyway, a few yeah. of those things. I'm sure at some point, maybe I would have gotten to you, but 
uh, a lot of the interviews were gathered just based on where I would be at the time, who was available, uh, what festivals I'd be at. The, I only took two specific trips collecting interviews to LA, which I guess you're in Pasadena. So I could have done that, but I apologize. You, you could have done it if you had been. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, I, 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 it's, it's fine. I'm mm -hmm. kidding. But, uh, but I love the people you talk to. You've got even uh, people like Guillermo del Toro. I mean, mm -hmm. there's filmmakers I've never heard of, which I thought was great because um, I like to discover new filmmakers. But Michael Bean is in it. Like, um, oh, yeah. Uh, Guillermo del Toro. I'm trying to think. Like, it just kept popping up. And I'm like, I know a lot of these people. I don't know Guillermo. But I do know a lot of the, the filmmakers that were in it. I, I was so impressed. And what I love is you really got them. You really got them to tell the no nonsense, nuts and bolts. You didn't make a documentary <coughs> that was like this sort of sweeping emotional. It's like, no, you really want to do it. Here's what it is. This is mm -hmm. the like, you know, roll up your shirt sleeves. You're gonna, your things are gonna get dirty. This, this is, this is how this works. Yes. So um, I do. I just appreciate that approach. Can can you talk about that a little? bit? Well, I think a big part of it was uh, I didn't want to ask these people the exact same questions they always get asked every time they sit for an interview. Because generally when somebody, an artist or somebody gets approached to do an interview, it's about a specific topic either related to their work or related to a body of work that their work is part of. So you have horror documentaries focusing on the 80s. You know, so the questions are all about like, how was making this movie? And how, uh, tell me about this effect shot and stuff like that. Uh, you know, or how, what's your process if it's an actor, you know, what's your process to get into character and all these things, this information is out there. Uh, it's been done to death. I wanted to be much more pragmatic and candid with uh, the questions I used uh, and focus really on just the specifics about their feelings and their knowledge of, of the actual business as it is. Um, and for them to uh, like right out, off the bat, I, I said, you know, say whatever you want to, if you say something that later you decide you, don't want on the record, please let me know. And I, I won't, I won't use it. Um, you know, they had that out, I think. Uh, and I think that let people loosen up a little bit and, uh, and get more open with their answers. And, uh, and, it, and it was a very conversational style of interview too. Uh, nothing formal, you know, I didn't ask them, please repeat the question in your answer. It was more of a conversation, which is an editing challenge, but it, uh, I think gets more candid and more natural answers out of people. Um, and part of it was pre-established relationships. Like I've, I've known a number of those people for a while, long enough now that it isn't a stranger sitting across from them. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, it, it's another comfort level thing. I'm not saying that, you know, every interview, you know, that was completely candid, like there was definitely people who were guarded, but for the most part, most of the stuff that I got felt very natural and off the cuff and honest. And that's really all I was hoping for. It it totally works, and uh, and um, you're very disarming. I feel like you could interview me now. We could have this whole conversation. But but I, I what I loved is what you got out of those people because as you pointed out, you didn't want to ask them the same questions they've always mm -hmm. been asked. I mean, I see Guillermo del Toro interviewed a, in a lot, you know, yeah. and I've never seen him really talk about like nuts and bolts, right? Like mm -hmm. the real nuts and bolts. And so just to see that you got that out of so many of the people that you talk to. And then also I have to compliment you <laughs> because you're so just self-effacing. You're just, and I feel like in some moments you were really emotionally kind of broken down. Like, well. like <laughs> you, filmed yourself, you filmed yourself in moments that maybe weren't the most flattering. And I mean that because what it does is it, it helps other filmmakers look at like how difficult this process is and how much, how difficult the struggle is. And that even, and I mean, look, when you began to document yourself, you had already made movies. You just didn't really consider yourself any, any at, at the level of success that you had expected for yourself. And you wanted to level yourself up. And the only way to do that is to, to really go deep. And you did that. Mm -hmm. so, That's Rob, part of it. That's definitely part of it. Uh, I also think that part of the journey was figuring out how to take myself a little less seriously uh, a bit, especially because I think that if you didn't have a sense of humor going into um, ma literally making a movie that follows yourself, uh, the whole thing would turn into a big vanity project um, because you'd spend a lot of time thinking about wh what you didn't want to show to the world and what fake sort of face to put out there. And things like that, and uh, and I, I right at the start, I, I figured this is this is a big risk. It could turn into like this piece of crap that nobody wants to see because it's like one guy 
going out and making a movie about himself uh, and, and how great that person is. Uh, so I brought on a friend of mine early on named Daryl Shaw. And if you know anything about my friendship with Daryl Shaw, he's the only person in my life where if I send him something I've been working on or a script or like, uh, it, it could be the simplest thing. It could be like, I, I play, I make music too. So if I send him like, a, and he, we collaborate on stuff. If I ever send him anything, like I, I've been, this is something I whip together. You know, what do you think? Is this a good direction? He'll send me, you know, eight pages of notes on like a 40 second clip of like, here's what you could do to improve it, et cetera. So I brought him on as my co-producer right at the beginning of production because I figured uh, he would keep me in check in that um, if I, through being myself, lost focus on the bigger picture of the movie, then he would be able to rein me in, uh, in a way that he, where he'd be like, no, man, that's just, it's too self-serving, that sort of thing. And then I brought in another editor once we actually hit post-production, Kevin Burke, who uh, made 24 by 36, a movie about movie posters, uh, and asked him the exact same thing at the front. The, you know, this is what the goal is for this movie. I don't want it to be, like, I want it to be warts and all, and I've recorded all the self-footage being incredibly honest, you know, uh, as much as I could be, um, you know, making sure I, I, that camera was in my face when I was feeling the emotion and not two days later, after I've had time to like rework it in my head to, to what it maybe it wasn't, you know, getting it in the moment for what it was. Um, I wanted to see that stuff on screen because uh, it's, it's, it at least paints a picture um, of the roller coaster that you go through in development and trying to get movies made uh, in a much clearer way. If it's, it's spontaneous and of the moment. Um, and I, I may, I had made a previous documentary before this uh, too, but I made the one I made right before it is a movie called skull world. And it's very much a character piece where I followed somebody for uh, a few years as they built this thing called box wars. Um, but one of the, you can watch that it's on Amazon prime and Tubi and stuff like that. Um, but one of the thing, the drawbacks of that process was that I, I had no real budget for the movie. Uh, so it's not like I could follow this subject, this person uh, for all, like very succinctly for the whole period of time. So I had to rely on whenever I could get out there and whenever they recorded self blogs and it just doesn't, it didn't really capture the whole story. I felt by the time we came to editing, it was like, there's just big story gaps. Um, so anyway, the, the point I guess I'm trying to make is that I, um, I kind of went with the rule that uh, I wouldn't let down moments uh, be removed from the film for the sole purpose of making the story seem uh, more upbeat and happier. And, uh, you know, I figured if there was inspiration to be taken from the skeleton of the story, it would come from the, the, the idea that there were, you know, setbacks and disappointments and rejection and all the things that actually happen when you're trying to do this stuff. Um, and of, of course, everybody's story is going to be different. Everybody's story is going to like everybody's path to getting where they want to be, depending on who you are, you know, what, <laughs> what you've already sort of got in your corner when you start, you know, the kind of support systems you have, uh, where you live in the world, like everybody's path is going to be completely different. Uh, and this is literally one story, right? So I, I at least wanted it to be representational of the mental process of of a creator, of somebody making uh, any kind of art, really. Um, but knowing full well that uh, whatever issues I may have, um, <laughs> whatever they may be, uh, won't be the same for everybody. And it, at least I'm putting those out there, too, to show, like, it's human beings creating these things. That, that was kind of the goal. Well, um, a couple things I want to comment on. One, I really need to see this documentary 24 by 36. Oh yeah, it's great. So can you, after this, like, um, I want that, uh, maybe if you can get me his contact info, I need to see, I, first of all, sure. I, I can't believe I didn't know it existed. It played Fantastic Fest. It's, it's, uh, uh it's, it's, out, it's been out there. Uh, I, I guess it just goes to show not everybody can know everything. So well, there's, you know what it is, is it, there's just too many movies. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but. I don't mean in a bad way either. I, I there is like, time, you, you will ones. never catch up. You will die before you watch everything you could watch. It's just a fact of life at this point. True. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, so I want to see that film and, and, and mm -hmm. talk to your friend. But the other thing is, is we live in an industry where the skill that almost everyone comes with is blowing smoke up your ass. I feel like that's the skill that almost everyone has. But this, mm -hmm. the thing that you really need is you need and I, I feel I've you know tried to do this. I, I really like having friends that can tell me to go fuck myself because oh, yeah. <laughs> it keeps me in check. Right. And if I know that I'm in check, if I'm going off in a wrong direction, it's like, 
score. Come on, fuck off. Like I, I like having friends who can be honest with me because otherwise you're surrounded by sycophants and that is not going to help you. And no, I, you no. I mean, I mean, look, but we're both not like, I've never really considered myself a part of Hollywood. I have worked, I guess, in the industry. I've been hired by companies sometimes uh, to do kind of more mainstream stuff, but I've always had my foot in indie film via film thread and you mm -hmm. being in Toronto. So you're just like, I mean, Toronto's a, I mean, that's a center. We're a big of, production hub, but yeah, exactly. I know what you're saying. It's a whole other thing. And having, having grown up in Detroit, mm -hmm. which is, I like to think I've got like um, a highly tuned bullshit detector and that came <laughs> from growing up in Detroit, but also I kind of feel a little bit, a little uh, bicultural in the sense that I grew, I grew up with the CBC mm. and, um, uh, Mr. Dressup and the Friendly Giant and a hockey. Did you night get a pokeroo there? Because that's like an Ontario only thing that might have made it down to you. Oh, I didn't get pokeroo, but I do remember going to see the Windsor Ballet, mm. of course, um, across the way. That's a whole other thing. Don't Google what that is. Um, <laughs> but I always loved the Canadian beers because they were higher in alcohol content. Generally. And they would serve you beer under the age of 21. I think the drinking age was what, 18, 19? 19, it's 19. It's 19. 19? Oh, yeah. so that's exactly when I started going to Canada. But I, <laughs> but I, I feel like I feel I relate, and also Canada. The Toronto Film Festival was the very first film festival I went to. Now I, they don't let me in. But that's they don't let you other, in. What does that mean? That's a whole <laughs> other. That's a whole. I have oh, a okay. storied. I have a storied history with the uh, with the Toronto Film Festival. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll. You can look it up. I I crashed the Toronto, Toronto Film Festival after they banned me from it. But that but but Clapboard Jungle. If mm -hmm. I was going to tell a film class or a, a person that's like I'm thinking of getting into indie movies, mm -hmm. I want them to see your movie. I mean, there's a couple other movies maybe they could watch, but I feel like yours is the most honest I've ever seen because you made it about yourself, but you really didn't make it about yourself per se. I and I feel like that was such a perfect approach. Um, the film, the, tell me about the film that you documented yourself making in the movie. You actually had a couple movies, but mm -hmm. the one, t tell me about the, the film, like where that ended up and what's been the history of that post, post the release of, of Clapboard Jungle. Sure. I mean, we were, we were, I was trying to get a bunch of stuff off the ground uh, while I was making Clapboard Jungle. Um, some of it I wasn't, I didn't even put in the, uh, in the movie because I signed an NDA and I wasn't sure of the legality of even bringing it up, but I spent like three or four months writing on a prominent uh, remake of a horror movie that, uh, you know, I, my, ultimately my draft didn't get used and it was for a pretty big company. Uh, but it's still, I, I couldn't even, I, I didn't know the legality of even mentioning it. So that was way, that was even too insider baseball for the, uh, the movie that was very much insider baseball. But, and, you know, I, I shot a single take looking uh, kind of thriller for next to no money in, in there. But the one that I was specifically trying to get made that did get made during that five year period without giving away like the entire arc of the documentary, because I feel like even though it's real life, people might want to go in fresh to, you know, I structure the movie very much like Rocky uh, and not 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 massaging reality to make it look like that. Like that's actually the path that it actually took. Like there's there's no. There's no fake, like no fake sort of arc built out of the, that five year period. That's actually how it went. Um, but it's very much meant to be like it builds to a, a triumph and then a self realization. And anyway, uh, Life Changer is the movie that got made while, uh, while I was um, making Clapboard Jungle. And uh, I didn't even know, I didn't even have the basic idea for that movie when I st first started shooting Clapboard Jungle. I was at the time trying to get uh, two other movies, uh, one called Tripped. Uh, which is like Pineapple Express meets the thing. I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, it, that's a super basic way to to explain it. There, it's there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and this other movie called The Eternal uh, made. And then once I hit enough brick walls with those, I started trying to cook up an idea for a movie that I can do for very very little budget and could shoot. Even if I had to shoot it on weekends, like Peter Jackson did with Bad Taste, and like just block shoot it like that as a bunch of little tiny short films. Um, I came up with this idea I thought I could do for cheap. And then I it gradually developed into something where we went out and raised uh, enough finance to make it. And then that came out in, uh, it came out on VOD and Blu-ray and DVD in 2019 uh, and hit Netflix in 2019 as well. Um, sold really well around the, like it's, it ended up on some great platforms and uh, we had some really good di uh, distribution partners and it played a ton of great film festivals. So it, it was a movie that, um, 
opened some doors and we ended up with uh, with further development and further sort of uh, movement on certain projects after that uh, as a partial result of that one doing decently well. And I've had offers come in as well um, of like, hey, well, we can give you this much towards the film. And then I have to calculate and go, can I actually make a movie with that kind of... Anyway, the long story short is that we there's this movie Life Changer that some people might have seen and some people might not have um, it, that I made uh, about a, a shapeshifter trying to make things right with the woman he loves. Um, it, again, that's a basic logline thing. There's more to it than that. But uh, it was on Netflix for a year. Uh, it even hit number one trending on Netflix for like uh, almost a two day period, which is crazy for a movie that cost, I don't know one week worth of uh, the food budget on like a Mission Impossible movie. <laughs> like it's, it's super tiny, but the path to getting that made was very much like we, you know, we lost our financers twice before we finally found financers that we actually moved forward with and made the movie on. So it was a long period of like, I think I cooked up the idea at the end of 2015 and then we finally made it to camera. No, maybe it might, it was at the end of 2014. And then we finally made it to camera in uh, at the end of 2017. Um, for uh, again, a small, small project, but it, it punched above its weight and did really well in festivals. And that's, uh, I mean, there's tons I could talk about, but I feel like I've, <laughs> there's so many interviews out there where I've talked about this movie now, uh, and all the bonus material on the Blu-ray and all that sort of thing. It's like, I, I've almost run out of things to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Life Changer, I like that the title of the movie you're making is called Life Changer, because I feel like that's what you are going through. I mean, um, you know, we all though, like at every yeah, moment right. of our lives, right? It's not a horror movie, but it's uh, you know, no. what what your the your your process and the pathway and the journey you're on is life changing, mm -hmm. and also I love that you open, you though your opening in the movie is so I I mean I was sold within one minute because the opening in the movie kind of mocks itself as its opening, right? Yeah. Never yeah. open with a quote, and you open with a quote, and, you, mm -hmm. and you're you talking about the title of the movie, and it's not even the title. It ended up not being the title, right? Mm -hmm. Like, just so many great little touches that um, ended up working out. I'm, I'm sure that you had a, a, a bunch of different titles for what Clapboard Jungle would have turned out. Yeah, to. yeah. I, so, I mean, I started production. I, the title was Untitled Films film business documentary and then it became a slate in game like you know you have a slate and you're playing a game to try and get your slate going right. uh i started shooting interviews under that title so i have some release forms where it's still called slate and game and i asked that was one of the interview questions early on was like what do you think of the title and i have some really honest answers about that and clapboard <laughs> jungle going forward which i'll make a super cut of at some point i'm sure but like uh because titles are hard titles are a really difficult thing um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, one is you don't want to title everybody has already, somebody's already done. It's got to be catchy for VOD sorting. Uh, this is less true now, but it still does affect on TVOD and EST, um, the transactional, like, you know, uh, Comcast and stuff. You want something higher in the alphabet because it sorts alphabetically. So there's, there's specific uh, kind of criteria you need to come up with for something that's catchy. And it's got to mean, be meaningful to the film itself. So it took a while to hit a title I liked. And even then, like if you, if, if you deconstructed the title Clapboard Jungle, I'm sure you could find uh, I, like, almost like anything. You could probably like, oh, so it's a riff on the title Blackboard Jungle. And like, you could probably dig down deep and go, you know, does this work and, or is it problematic? Or, you know, there's a million things you could probably do to go to overanalyze it. But I, I, I liked where we ended up. Did, did, the, did the distributor say you should rename it a Clapboard Jungle? Not this time, but um, but like uh, that happened with Life Changer in the U.S. The title is the Life Changer on the art. Oh, oh um, really? It's funny. Which it's is funny. weird to me because it, it's the, the title had more than one meaning to me. So by making it the Life Changer, it made it just about the guy, and and it it's not it's not really what the movie is. Like there was at least three meanings in that title, but in the U.S. it's got one meaning. So well, it's, uh, one of my favorite stories about titles and changing mm -hmm. them is George Lucas's Star Wars, which was originally titled The Star Wars, that yeah. 20th Century Fox tried to convince him to change the title of the movie because their market research, and they passed this along to George, mm -hmm. uh, thankfully he ignored it, but they said, you know, our market research says people think this movie is about celebrities fighting, <laughs> which is the dumbest, I, I don't know. I think you got to stick to your guns on 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 stuff like that. So 
Well, I know the movie is coming out. Like it's out on video on demand on on all platforms. It's coming out in a special Blu-ray edition with like a lot of special. Features. Yeah, I uh, so I author I author Blu-rays for a living. Uh, I mean, that's part of my job. Like I run a post-production company. That's how I stay afloat. Uh, but it's a very like low key company. I don't have a big staff. It's basically me and some freelancers when I bring them on. So I've been authoring Blu-ray since like 2003 or DVDs since 2003 and then Blu-ray since about 2010, let's say around there. Uh, so I've been working with Arrow, uh, Arrow Video, who are putting it out in April to put together one of the craziest special editions I think I've ever put together. I think if you added up all the material on the Blu-ray that's coming out in April, uh, including all the commentary tracks and everything, uh, you're looking at about 24 hours and 45 minutes of material, which like is uh, pretty there crazy. Egg? Are there? Oh, yeah, there's definitely them? there's there's Easter eggs. I I hate the okay. the absence of Easter eggs. So I'm okay, also working so. on the Psycho Gorman Blu-ray for Canada right now too, and I'm cooking oh, up some. Okay, you saw Psycho so. Gorman. You're the well, one other friend of mine that's seen Psycho Gorman. We're oh, friends. I've oh, seen it. I, that's that's the people who made that movie are just people I've known for years. Okay, um, that has to be one of my favorite horror movies this year. It's early in the year, I know, but like, holy crap, that that movie. Oh, is, yeah. You think they'll never do that, and then they do it, and they don't give a fuck. That's. It's awesome. Oh God, mm. I love Psycho Gorman. Oh, yeah, yeah so Steve is one of those sort of original kind of kind of filmmakers that um, uh, he's just in a different world. He's he's on his own sort of plane with the stuff he makes. Like Manborg, if you saw Manborg, it's something he made over like a two year period in his basement, basically. And it's uh, it's it's green screen and puppets that he's made and like actors. Anyway, you got to see Manborg. It's, oh, okay, it's I recommended that I see The Void, which he also made. yeah, The Void's also his film too. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely much more of a traditional. Uh, traditional is the wrong word. It's 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 very polished and uh, sort of a love letter to the carpenter kind of thing. Uh, Look, okay, so stay on after we finish this. Yeah. I want to talk to you about that. Uh, right. Sure, but but um, the movies, the the, the uh, clapboard jungle. And even if you're not a filmmaker, I feel like there's an entry. It's like someone who aspires to do something mm -hmm. beyond. They're they're at a level. They're like, I want to level up. I feel like that's our whole. I mean, um, a platform video game is kind of a, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's like an analogy for life, right? Like, yeah. constantly trying to level up. We got it. We're not gonna we're not gonna solve this issue till we get past this boss character. Well, and, I, yeah, video games a great analogy because uh, right. it, it's the knowledge is power thing, right? So. Right. To some extent, I mean, ultimately, raw talent really matters, and you know, but you can, you can make yourself better by doing and by learning and by like taking things seriously and really thinking about the stuff you're putting together. And uh, in a way, it is very much like a video game because you know, you if you want to gain more knowledge, there's countless hours of stuff on YouTube you can watch. There's film books going back 50 years. There's behind the scenes materials. I mean, if you have a video collection, you have a film school on your shelf that you're either utilizing or you're not utilizing. There is so much material you can learn from out there. Uh, stuff like Film Threat and uh, Indie Film Hustle and No Film School and all this stuff that exist to help you level up by basically gaining, giving you experience. That's what you're getting. You're getting experience points in video game analogy. Uh, and the more you produce and the more you create and the more you direct and, uh, you know, even if all you've got is a mobile phone, a smartphone, you can make something. And the more something you make, the more experience you make, uh, you you have. And that will t in turn make you able to face challenges as they come up because you've done similar things before, at least. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's, there's outreach programs and uh, film markets you can go to. Like some of the best education I ever got in the film business was... I think 2009 was my first year I ever went to the American film market. That was my first film market was uh, 2009. And just walking into one of those hotels and walking stand to stand to stand and going, oh, shit, this is a big pool to play in. Uh, and then and realizing how much stuff gets made a year and compared to how much stuff people actually get to see. Uh, it can be a really humbling experience. And then once you get out, break out of that and go to Cannes or uh, mm -hmm. Berlin, it's like it, it's this giant world that. You don't, you aren't even aware of because you're, if, especially if you're only paying attention to what's coming up in your net, Netflix queue, right? Like it, it's a big world out there and you got to like absorb as much as you can in order to climb. I, I always like to use the analogy, climb the ladder, right? You're always just climbing. You're never going to stop climbing, but at least as long as you're grabbing the next rung, that's what matters. Yeah, a absolutely. Um, and I'm sure that at AFM is where you must have met Lloyd Kaufman. That's probably uh, the first time. Was oh, it 
Yeah, the first time was at, at AFM. Uh, I remember I walked into his office to have a conversation and he threw a bag of pretzels at me and was like, you want some? And that was like the first, uh, um, but yeah. Uncle I, I, Lloyd, I love Uncle yeah, yeah. Lloyd. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, that, that, he has that, that nickname for a very good reason. Yeah. Um, he's a, he's a soup, he comes across, he's a very super nice guy. I've run into him at parties, I've drank with him. Uh, you know, uh, in, in offices over the Palais the last time he was, I, can't, I think it was the last year he went to con because, you know, his people got arrested for demonstrating in the streets and he hasn't been back since from what I can tell. But uh, anyway, yeah, he's a great guy. Well, um, Justin McConnell, I cannot thank you enough for being on the Film Threat Podcast. Clapboard Jungle is a movie you have to see. Um, an incredible documentary. Whether yep. you're an aspiring filmmaker or not, it's an inspiration. And I'm glad that you pointed out Rocky because mm -hmm. I really felt like, wow, you are really portraying yourself as like a failure. You were at the, the beginning of the movie as like a guy who felt like a failure. I'm not saying you were a failure, but you 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 certainly were brutally honest. And to that Rocky analogy, I just I I really love that because um, when you said that, it just it all made sense. So congratulations. The other thing is. Uh, I, uh, some news I'm announcing right now. Justin McConnell has agreed to do a film threat watch party with Clapboard Jungle. The date is to be determined, but if you follow uh, Film Threat social media, you'll find out. We do film threat watch parties every Friday at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. It's on uh, Facebook, Twitch, uh, YouTube. It's mm -hmm. live. You can ask questions. Justin's going to invite on a bunch of people who are involved in the film, and I'm I'm making you commit to it now. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Can okay. I add something to your previous point, that. though? About can I briefly add something to your previous point? Please. Uh, Please. I just wanted to mention that, like you you mentioned, like I showed owed myself as somebody who felt like a failure, and I just want to say, like for most of the artists out there, you show me an artist who doesn't have some level of imposter syndrome, uh, and that's somebody who's not really being honest with themselves. Even at the highest level, I'm sure there are people out there who, you know, I bet there's a great quote from El Gustavo Cooper in the film where he's like, I bet Steven Spielberg sits there and goes, I suck. I could be better. I'm sure I could be better. And I think if you stop saying that to yourself, if you stop analyzing your work and going, I can make this better next time, or here's what I would do to improve my work. If you're not that focused on improving what you do, even in like personal life, it's like if you're not at least somewhat analyzing like where you might be going wrong or making mistakes, you're not going to grow as, as a person or as an artist. And uh, and ultimately your work's going to suffer, I think. And I'm not saying like you could hate if you want to feel free to hate anything I do. Uh, believe me, as an artist, I hate myself more than you do. <laughs> it, it, it's a joke, but it's there's truth to it. You know what I mean? I, I, I feel like it if everybody just kind of opened up a bit more about how much we're all kind of flying blind to some degree, especially now with the upheaval that the business is going through and how we're in a new frontier with so many technologies and streaming platforms and how things get made and how you make money, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with asking for help and there's nothing wrong for saying, I don't know something and trying to remedy that. I think that's really important that when you're a filmmaker. Justin, you said it all. Thank you so much for being on the Film Threat Podcast and Thank you. For doing the Film Threat Watch Party at an undetermined date, but follow us on social media and you will know about uh, the, this watch party. I, I think it's going to be something very special. I hope it is too. <laughs>